Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and in today's video we're going to explain what neurotransmitters are, how they work, and then we'll decide how they should be ranked. Before we can discuss specific neurotransmitters, first we should discuss what neurotransmitters are. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that allow neurons to communicate with each other. Neurotransmitters are unique, as each one has a specific chemical structure that allows it to interact with specific receptor proteins on the postsynaptic neuron. This is the neuron that's receiving the signal from a presynaptic neuron. Pre and postsynaptic just tell you whether the neuron we're talking about is the one sending the signal or receiving the signal. This selectivity ensures that neurotransmitters only bind to the appropriate receptors, allowing for precise communication between neurons. We previously discussed how communication works in the neurotoxin video. To prepare for release, neurotransmitters have to make their way to the synapse, where they must first be packaged into vesicles. In cell biology, a vesicle is a structure within or outside of a cell, consisting of a liquid, or cytoplasm, enclosed by a lipid bilayer. Vesicles are used for a lot of cellular processes, and the ones that we're going to be discussing in this video are specifically transport vesicles. In order for transport vesicles to be able to transport neurotransmitters, they have to travel along the cell's highway, the cytoskeleton. Now if you thought some of the road planning was complex in certain places in America, just wait till you see what the cytoskeleton looks like. It's a network of connected protein filaments and tubes, giving structure to the cell. To reach the synapse, the transport vesicles need to make their way along the axon. The vesicles don't move along the cytoskeleton on their own, they require chungus motor proteins such as dynein and kinesin. These proteins convert ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. You might recall that ATP is the US dollar of the cell. These giant chungus motor proteins do a giant clown shoe walk, and you might even say that they drag Santa's sack of neurotransmitters all the way to the North Pole. Neurons can even be as long as one meter, as is the case for the sciatic nerve, the longest neuron in the human body. Due to this length and the diversity of neurotransmitters, they require specialized transportation. Axonal transport is the phenomenon in which molecules synthesized in the cell body, the portion of the cell containing the nucleus, undergo relocation into axons and synapses. In a nutshell, there's two different forms of transport, fast transport and slow transport. Fast transport is fast. No, really. What do we even really mean when we say transport is fast? Some scientists did experiments using radio labeling. This is a process where you incorporate a unique isotope of an element into a structure of interest, such as some molecule, and then you study the behavior of that structure in a biological system. A specific isotope of an element has a specific number of neutrons which can be exploited for imaging biological systems. This occurs through various different radiation mechanisms. So these scientists showed that some vesicles were able to travel across the cytoskeleton at a speed of about 50 to 200 millimeters per day, this is quite fast, especially when you consider how tiny an organelle is. These vesicles were bound to the motor proteins kinesin and dynein, and this allows for movement on the microtubules, and this also allows different regulators to interact with the motor proteins. These boys are quite fast, so they dusted the rest of the molecules. We mentioned that there was another form of transport, slow transport. In slow transport, scientists observed polar molecules and small proteins like neurotransmitter precursors moving 0.2 to 10 millimeters per day. The specific mechanism of motion is not fully understood. However, the slow axonal transport is a bit like a conveyor belt. The process of slow axonal transport is able to move noodle-like building blocks for the cytoskeleton to the axons and synapses. The process of slow transport takes place over weeks and days, but the diversity of this process is also annoying, cruising with diffusion-like based motion, stop-and-go traffic and lane changes, as well as driving on fresh asphalt as it's made. This is known as polymerization-based transport. On arrival at the axon terminal, the cytoplasmic enzymes begin converting some of the small neurotransmitter precursors into neurotransmitters. The vesicles play a significant role at this point, and the cycle begins with neurotransmitter uptake, where neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, enter vesicles through a process called active transport. The filled vesicles will then be grouped together, as they're released or as space opens up. These vesicles will bind to docking sites, and they can be opened up by ions within action potential. The more scandalous vesicles undergo kiss-and-run fusion, in which it attaches to the membrane briefly, releases some of its contents and runs away. If they can't escape, they are regarded as kiss and stay. The neurotransmitters have now entered the synaptic space. As a consequence, they will now bind to the specific receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Some neurotransmitters can stimulate the postsynaptic neuron to fire an action potential, while others can inhibit firing. Some neurotransmitters can also modulate the activity of other neurotransmitters or affect the permeability of the postsynaptic membrane to ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. Once the neurotransmitters have bound to the receptors and completed their function, they are typically removed from the synapse in one of several ways. The neurotransmitter may be taken back up into the presynaptic neuron for reuse, or it's possible that they'll be broken down by enzymes in the synapse, breaking the neurotransmitters down into inactive metabolites. So hopefully this has given you a bit of an intro into how neurotransmitters work and the complexity of cellular processes even when just considering transport vesicles. Biology is super complicated. 
Hey there, are you tired of dealing with online restrictions and worrying about your privacy? Well, I've got some exciting news for you. Introducing Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everyone. And guess what? It currently has more than 6 million users worldwide. That's a testament to its effectiveness. Just like myelin sheath cells protect and enhance the transmission of signals along our neurons, Atlas VPN shields your data, ensuring it travels safely through the vast online network. Worried about your sensitive information being intercepted? Atlas VPN acts like GABA, inhibiting unwanted access to your private data. It keeps your online activities concealed, just like the synaptic cleft between neurons. As a neurotransmitter aficionado, I love exploring vast realms of information. And with Atlas VPN, I can access a wealth of knowledge unrestricted by geographical boundaries. It's like having a synaptic connection to the world's information hub. For a limited time, you can experience the neurotransmitter-like powers of Atlas VPN Premium for just $183 per month. That's a synaptically charged offer you won't find anywhere else. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, this is a no-brainer. Protect your synaptic pathways of data transmission and experience the wonders of Atlas VPN for this incredibly low price. Activate your neurons and click that link to embark on an extraordinary journey with Atlas VPN. I want to thank Atlas VPN for their support of this channel. Now back to the tier list. Let's start with dopamine. What is dopamine? Dopamine is often dubbed the feel-good neurotransmitter due to its key role in driving pleasure and motivation. It's tied to activities such as movement, memory, pleasure, reward and motivation, behavior, cognition, attention, sleep and arousal, as well as mood and learning. When we partake in rewarding experiences, dopamine is released, activating dopamine receptors, leading to increased neuron firing, which induces a positive, uplifting mood. The epicenter of reward and pleasure in the brain involves several key structures, most prominently in the nucleus accumbens, which is often referred to as the pleasure center of the brain. The ventral tegmental area, located in the midbrain, controls diverse behavioral events. Notably, in experiments where these areas were electrically stimulated, a hungry rat would often give up food for the sheer pleasure of self-stimulation. Sometimes you have to make your choices, it's either food or self-stimulation. The discovery of dopamine can be traced back to the 1950s, when it was discovered by a Swedish scientist, Arvid Carlson. His work on dopamine led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in the year 2000. If we're going to be talking about dopamine, it might be worth mentioning how it's made. Dopamine is made starting from phenylalanine in the body, which is an essential amino acid. Phenylalanine uses the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, 2PAH, to make tyrosine. Tyrosine is then converted through tyrosine hydroxylase, 6PAH, which forms L-DOPA. L-DOPA is then able to undergo a decarboxylation from the enzyme DOPA decarboxylase, which results in the formation of dopamine. So if that went over your head, just to summarize briefly, dopamine is made in the body, starting from the essential amino acid phenylalanine. After phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine, tyrosine gets hydroxylated into L-DOPA, and finally L-DOPA is decarboxylated to afford dopamine. So that's the significance of dopamine. It won someone a Nobel Prize. It's made in our body from one of the essential amino acids. But how does dopamine work? When dopamine is synthesized in neurons, it gets transported into a vesicle through VMAT, which stands for Vesicular Monoamine Transporter. If you're not sure what a vesicle is, a vesicle is a bit like a cargo container, and the proteins that move the vesicle are like the truck carrying the containers. Once the containers get to their destination, they're unloaded, and just like the real world, containers are often reused. After dopamine leaves the presynaptic neuron in a process called exocytosis, dopamine will bind to one of the dopamine receptors, which are often referred to as D1 to D5 for convenience. The dopamine receptors are present on the postsynaptic neuron, so this is where the dopamine is going to bind. If you're interested in what the function of each of the dopamine receptors is, I'll provide a brief summary here. The D1 receptor is involved with memory, attention, impulse control, regulation of renal function, and locomotion. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby, use some dopamine now. <laughs> the D2 receptor is also involved with the locomotion. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the D2 receptor is also involved with locomotion, in addition to attention, sleep, memory, and learning. The D3 receptor is involved with cognition, impulse control, attention, and sleep. We also know that D4 also tends to be involved with the same processes that D3 is involved with. In the case of D5, it has a role in decision-making, cognition, attention, and renin secretion. It's probably clear by now that receptors are complex. Speaking of complex, why don't we talk about the G-protein-coupled receptor complex? G-protein coupled receptors are frequently referred to as GPCRs because biologists want to save time. GPCRs are a large family of cell surface receptors involved in signal transduction. These play a crucial role in various physiological processes and unsurprisingly, they're the target of many drugs. 
GPCRs can bind a wide range of ligands, including neurotransmitters. Now what do I mean when I say ligand? In chemistry, when we're talking about ligands, normally that's something that binds to a metal center. But in the case of biology, a ligand is any molecule that binds to a receptor. So for the purposes of this video, we're talking about ligands from a biology perspective, rather than a chemistry perspective. I apologize if that upsets any chemists out there. The general mechanism of G-protein coupled receptor activation involves the following steps. Step 1. Ligand binding. When a specific ligand such as dopamine or acetylcholine binds to the extracellular domain, which is just the part outside of the cell, of a G-protein coupled receptor, it induces a conformational change in that receptor. The second step is G-protein activation. Once the G-protein coupled receptor undergoes a conformational change, it enables an interaction with a heterotrimeric G-protein located on the intracellular side of the membrane. This is on the inside of the cell. G-proteins are composed of three subunits, the alpha subunit, the beta subunit, and the gamma subunit. The third step is G-protein exchange. When the G-protein coupled receptor is activated by binding to a ligand such as dopamine, a complex chain of events is set into motion. The GDP molecule bound to the alpha subunit of the G-protein is replaced with GTP, leading to the dissociation of the alpha subunit from the beta and gamma subunits. The fourth step is effector activation. The GTP bound alpha subunit and the beta gamma subunits can now independently regulate various intracellular effector molecules, such as enzymes or ion channels. This just means that the GPCR is able to interact with other parts of the cell as a consequence of the interaction with the neurotransmitter or other molecules. These effectors mediate the transmission of the signal initiated by the ligand binding to the G-protein coupled receptor. The fifth step is signal amplification and termination. The activated alpha subunit or the beta gamma subunits can interact with multiple effector molecules, leading to the amplification of the initial signal. The signaling cascade continues until the GTP on the alpha subunit is hydrolyzed to GDP, which is just going from the triphosphate to the diphosphate. This is where we lose energy, and I like to think about GTP as the Canadian dollar of the cell. It's not used as much as ATP, but it's still common enough. The hydrolysis of GTP to GDP causes the reassembly of the G-protein complex and terminates the signal. Once the GPCR cascade is complete, several different physiological responses can occur, depending on the type of G-protein as well as the cellular context. For example, let's talk about the context of dopamine signaling. Dopamine binds to dopamine receptors, which are a class of G-protein coupled receptors. These receptors can be broadly classified into D1-like receptors, which includes D1 and D5 receptors, in addition to D2-like receptors, which includes D2, D3, and D4. When dopamine binds to D1-like receptors, these GPCRs couple to G-alpha subunit proteins and stimulate the production of cyclic adenosine monophosphate, although it can also be called cyclic AMP. However, when dopamine binds to D2-like receptors, these GPCRs couple to GI-alpha proteins, also known as G-alpha-I proteins, thanks biologists, and inhibit cyclic AMP production. These distinct pathways enable GPCRs to initiate intracellular signaling cascades that are specific to the receptor, ligand, and downstream effectors involved. D1 and D5 couple to G-stimulatory sites. You can call this the good spot, or perhaps the G-spot. And this activates adenylcyclase. The activation of adenylcyclase leads to the production of cyclic AMP, which results in the production of protein kinase A, also known as PKA. This is a different PKA than we talk about in chemistry, so again, I apologize chemists. PKA production leads to further gene expression in the nucleus. D2 through D4 receptors couple to G inhibitory sites. G proteins are guanine nucleotide binding proteins, which inhibit adenylcyclase and activate potassium channels. Dopamine also plays a critical role in neurodegenerative disorders. In the case of Parkinson's disease, when a significant amount of damage or impairment occurs in the basal ganglia, less dopamine is produced and movement disorders arise. Dopamine shortage is responsible for movement issues in patients with Parkinson's. Although the mechanism of damage isn't fully understood, Parkinson's disease also impacts noradrenaline, leading to many of the non-movement-based symptoms seen in Parkinson's patients through antagonism of the dopamine receptors. Compounds such as bromocryptine can be used to target D2, while others target enzymes involved in the synthesis or decomposition of dopamine. Furthermore, dopamine is central to addiction. Substances like cocaine and methamphetamine increase dopamine release or block its reuptake, leading to a dopamine surge in the brain's reward circuits. This can cause intense pleasure, but over time, the brain adjusts to these elevated dopamine levels, often causing tolerance. By reducing its own dopamine production, or by reducing the number of dopamine receptors, potentially leading to dependence. You might be surprised that certain foods such as cheese can also stimulate dopamine release. This is due to the protein casomorphine, which is an opioid peptide, illustrating how dopamine can be affected by what we consume. Since cheese causes the release of dopamine, I think we could put dopamine right into C tier, because cheese starts with a C. 
Next, we have noradrenaline. Noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine, is a crucial neurotransmitter that orchestrates the body's stress response. It functions rather subtly until moments of stress or danger arise, when it swiftly activates, priming the body for fight or flight. Noradrenaline acts as the primary chemical messenger of the sympathetic nervous system, triggering an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. This helps it raise alertness and bolsters blood flow to muscles, thereby preparing the body for intense tasks which may require immediate attention and focus. Noradrenaline is primarily synthesized in the locus ceruleus, a small but significant part of the brain. This region serves as a master control, responding to stressors and indicating a cascade of bodily effects. It's worth noting that the adrenal glands also produce noradrenaline, which functions as a hormone in the body more broadly. Dopamine is converted into norepinephrine through the enzyme dopamine beta-hydroxylase. It can be further converted into epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, through the enzyme phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase. Our understanding of noradrenaline owes much to the groundbreaking work of Ulf von Euler, a Swedish scientist. He identified and named noradrenaline in the 1940s, a contribution that won him a share of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1970. Noradrenaline operates by interacting with several types of receptors, specifically termed adrenergic receptors. These receptors primarily fall into two categories, alpha-adrenergic and beta-adrenergic. Activation of alpha-adrenergic receptors typically leads to blood vessel constriction and a rise in blood pressure. Conversely, when beta-adrenergic receptors are stimulated, they promote an increased heart rate and a release of energy from stored glucose. It's important to note that adrenergic receptors can also interact with other neurotransmitters. Earlier I mentioned that dopamine is a biochemical precursor to noradrenaline, and it's interesting to note that dopamine can also bind to certain adrenergic receptors, causing various effects. However, imbalances in the noradrenaline system can lead to unfavorable outcomes. Elevated levels of noradrenaline may result in intensified anxiety, excessive sweating, irregular heartbeat, high blood pressure, as well as tumors. Low levels could manifest as anxiety, depression, ADHD, memory issues, low blood pressure, and other issues. As such, noradrenaline plays a crucial role in many mental health disorders. For instance, depression has been linked to low levels of noradrenaline, explaining why some antidepressants work by increasing its availability. On the other hand, individuals with anxiety disorders often exhibit high levels of noradrenaline, which mirrors the body's amplified response to perceived threats. Noradrenaline's role in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is a focus of ongoing research, as shifts in the noradrenergic system have been observed in these conditions. However, the exact role of noradrenaline in these disorders remains unclear. In terms of addiction, noradrenaline is involved in the withdrawal symptoms of certain substances such as opioids. A surge in noradrenaline levels during withdrawal may lead to symptoms of anxiety and agitation. Since it pertains to learning and memory, noradrenaline plays a part in memory consolidation, especially for emotional experiences. This video is making me so emotional. This is why stressful or exciting events often leave a more lasting impression, with noradrenaline working to engrave these experiences into your memory. Talking about all these neurotransmitters sure makes me nervous. Noradrenaline definitely gets my blood flowing, so I think that's pretty stimulating. This can go right into S tier. Serotonin. Serotonin is frequently referred to as 5-HT, which stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine. Tryptamines are a class of molecules of which dimethyltryptamine as well as psilocybin are members. In the body, 5-hydroxytryptamine, also known as serotonin, gets referred to as the feeling of well-being and happiness neurotransmitter. Serotonin plays a significant role in almost every physiological function, from modulating mood, sleep, appetite, to cognitive functions like memory and learning. It's even involved with taking a dump. The majority of the serotonin in the body is synthesized in the gastrointestinal tract, mainly in enterochromaffin cells. This is abbreviated as EC. Do you know the enterochromaffin man? Whereas only a small percentage of the body's serotonin is produced within the nervous system. It's been observed that a reduction in the number of enterochromaffin cells occurs for patients suffering from chronic constipation, indicating a lack of serotonin in those cells. That sure is a crappy situation, but treatment with receptor agonists has demonstrated some effectiveness. Let's briefly talk about the synthesis of serotonin. Serotonin originates from tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid. Tryptophan is converted into 5-HTP by tryptophan 5-hydroxylase. 5-HTP is just 5-hydroxytryptophan. 5-hydroxytryptophan then undergoes decarboxylation to form serotonin. The discovery of serotonin dates back to 1948. Its discovery is credited to Maurice Report, a biochemist from Cleveland, Ohio. Serotonin functions by binding to serotonin receptors situated on neuronal surfaces. These receptors are divided into multiple categories, from 5-HT1 through 5-HT7. Different receptor classes serve distinct functions. For example, anti-anxiety drugs often target 5-HT1A, while many antipsychotic medications are antagonists at 5-HT2A. 
psychedelic drugs tend to be agonists of 5-HT2A, which is the opposite effect. A number of anxiolytic and antidepressant compounds target different serotonin receptors. Psychotropic drugs such as LSD, mescaline, cocaine, and amphetamines are also able to impact 5-HT functions via 5-HT1A, 5-HT2A, and monoaminergic transporters. Another way that serotonin is impacted is through the use of SSRIs, which stand for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Serotonin's link to mental health disorders is well established. MJ, a 65-year-old woman with a past medical history of major depression, presenting to the emergency room with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and drowsiness that have persisted for one day. Two days prior, the patient began to feel drowsy. She thus self-medicated with 40 cups of coffee over the course of two days, including drinking 20 cups of coffee in a short period of time. The patient had a medical history of major depression, dyslipidemia, a condition marked by abnormal concentrations of lipids or lipoproteins in the blood, and Parkinson's disease. Initial laboratory tests showed an elevated white blood cell count, as well as lactate dehydrogenase and creatinine kinase levels. Based on these clinical findings, and according to the previously published Hunter criteria, the patient was diagnosed with serotonin syndrome. Paroxetine and trazodone were the suspected triggers. In a balanced system, serotonin enhances mood, suppresses appetite, and acts as a type of feel-good neurotransmitter. However, too much of it can be a bad thing. Too much serotonin can cause a condition known as serotonin syndrome. Serotonin floods the brain, causing agitation, restlessness, confusion, rapid heart rate, dilated pupils, loss of muscle coordination, and heavy sweating, among other symptoms. In severe cases, it can be life-threatening. As with anything in life, the key is moderation. Let's get back to the tier list. Serotonin also influences learning and memory. High serotonin levels facilitate learning and memory processes, whereas low levels impair them. An interesting illustration of serotonin's effect on learning is the concept of learned helplessness. As repeated exposure to uncontrollable stressors can disrupt avoidance learning, a process tied to serotonin levels in the brain. Serotonin is a pretty trippy molecule. I would be remiss if we didn't put it into S tier, which is appropriate because it starts with an S. Next we have glutamate. Glutamate is often referred to as the megaphone of the brain. This is because it's the most prevalent neurotransmitter in our nervous system. This molecule plays a critical role as the brain's principal excitatory neurotransmitter, propelling neuron communication and enabling essential cognitive functions. Whether we're working towards solving a challenging puzzle or learning a new language, glutamate is an indispensable protagonist in these processes. The biosynthesis of glutamate stems from the TCA cycle in muscle tissues via alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate gets converted into glutamate via a transaminase enzyme. Now while that's what happens in muscles, in glial cells, glutamate synthase, also known as glutaminase, can convert glutamine into glutamate within the neuron. The discovery of glutamate can be attributed to the Japanese scientist Kikune Ikeda, who first identified it in 1908 while investigating the unique umami flavor in seaweed broth. Glutamate is the molecule behind monosodium glutamate, also known as MSG, which is a popular flavor enhancer which gives food its unique umami taste. While it was known to be a part of the umami flavor, the importance of glutamate as a neurotransmitter wasn't recognized until much later. So the next time you're savoring a bowl of ramen or a piece of sushi, remember, you're enjoying a little bit of glutamate magic outside of the brain. Glutamate interacts with several different receptors, including the widely studied NMDA, AMPA, and kinate receptors. These ionotropic receptors quickly open up ion channels to provoke an immediate response. Additionally, the metabotropic glutamate receptors play a more indirect role by modulating neuronal activity. While glutamate is crucial to cognitive function, an imbalance can cause serious issues. Too much glutamate can trigger excitotoxicity, which is the damaging overstimulation of neurons. This overexcitation has been linked to numerous neurological disorders, such as stroke, Alzheimer's disease, and ALS. You might be concerned that the glutamate in your diet could pose a risk to you. If you're concerned that your dietary MSG could pose health problems, this is something that you can bring up with your doctor. The umami taste that we experience when we eat MSG can also be further strengthened and intensified through the addition of certain nucleotides, such as inosine monophosphate, known as IMP, and guanosine monophosphate, known as GMP. What happens is glutamate can bind to the receptor, and the interaction of IMP and GMP helps stabilize the binding of the glutamate to the receptor. This results in a slightly stronger, slightly more pleasant taste. GMP, which is guanosine monophosphate, is the same G as GTP and GDP, guanosine triphosphate and guanosine diphosphate, respectively. That means that this is like the sucky version of the Canadian dollar, but it isn't that sucky because it still makes food taste better. Oh, Canada! Glutamate's influence extends into mental health as well. Imbalances in glutamate activity have been associated with various mental health disorders. For instance, schizophrenia is believed to involve a hypofunction or underactivity of NMDA receptors, a type of glutamate receptor. 
it's worth noting that this decreased function does not equate to a deficiency in overall glutamate levels. Depending on multiple factors, hypofunction could lead to either decreased or excessive glutamate release. Furthermore, glutamate levels are also impacted in mood regulation. Abnormalities in glutamate transmission have also been linked to major depressive disorder. When it comes to addiction, glutamate is a key actor. Substances of abuse can disrupt glutamate homeostasis, causing alterations in the brain's reward system. For example, alcohol withdrawal has been correlated with an increase in glutamate levels, contributing to withdrawal symptoms and cravings. A crucial player in long-term potentiation, glutamate strengthens synaptic connections over time, as it is a crucial player in long-term potentiation. This process is fundamental to learning and memory. It's a normal part of biological development. Glutamate is such a strong neurotransmitter, it's such a stimulating molecule, that I think we could actually put it outside of S tier, since it can overexcite your neurons. Next we have GABA, the Zen master of the neurotransmitters, keeping your brain calm, cool, and collected. As the proverbial brake pedal of the brain, gamma aminobutyric acid, commonly known as GABA, works by facilitating the influx of chloride ions into the neuron, reducing the likelihood of neuronal firing, and thereby promoting relaxation, reducing stress, and facilitating sleep. When it comes to GABA receptors, we're dealing with two main types, GABA-A and GABA-B. GABA-A receptors are ionotropic, which means they provide a direct passage for ions when activated, typically causing an immediate response. In contrast, GABA-B receptors are metabotropic. They indirectly open ion channels through a sequence of internal cellular events, leading to effects that might be slower to onset, but longer lasting. Maintaining the balance of GABA is pivotal for our well-being, with imbalances linked to significant physical and mental health complications. For instance, an excess of GABA may result in sedation and potential respiratory distress, while a deficiency could lead to conditions such as anxiety, insomnia, and epilepsy. In genetic disorders such as Huntington's disease, patients typically exhibit reduced levels of GABA. The correlation between GABA and mental health disorders is compelling. In the case of anxiety disorders, an insufficiency in GABA activity often leads to hyperactivity in the brain, which heightens anxiety. Anti-anxiety medications such as benzodiazepines function by enhancing the inhibitory effects of GABA, fostering a sense of calm. Certain substances like alcohol and benzodiazepines increase GABAergic activity, resulting in feelings of relaxation and sedation. However, there's a flip side. Long-term use of these substances can lead to the brain adjusting to these elevated GABA levels, potentially resulting in tolerance and dependence. Oftentimes this can also lead to severe withdrawal. GABA also has an intriguing role in learning and memory. While it slows neuron firing, GABA is essential for brain plasticity, which underpins our ability to learn and remember. GABA provides the necessary pause in neuronal firing, allowing us to perceive and understand the world around us more effectively. An imbalance in GABA, either too much or too little, can disrupt this delicate cognitive balance. Since this tier list is about which neurotransmitter is the most stimulating, I think GABA has to go into F tier, because this is the least stimulating, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Because GABA's the brain's pacifier. It helps keep emotional meltdowns at bay, or at least it does its best. Last but not least, we have acetylcholine. This isn't the last neurotransmitter in the body, but this is the last one that we're talking about for this tier list. There's way too many neurotransmitters to talk about all of them in one video. Acetylcholine is often abbreviated as ACH, and it's a significant neurotransmitter in both the central and peripheral nervous systems. Acetylcholine is instrumental in executing functions such as muscle contraction, regulation of heart rate, learning, and memory. An enzyme called choline acetyltransferase causes a reaction between choline and an acetyl group to create acetylcholine. This is made at the end of nerve cells. Acetylcholine was first discovered in the early 20th century by Otto Lovi, a trailblazing physiologist. His groundbreaking experiments demonstrated the chemical communication between neurons, and this got him a share of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1936. Acetylcholine's action primarily takes place through two types of receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors get their name due to their activation by nicotine. Nicotinic receptors are mainly found at the junction between nerves and muscles. Upon activation, these receptors facilitate muscle contractions. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, on the other hand, get stimulated by muscarine and are predominantly found in the brain, heart, and smooth muscle. The effects caused by the activation of these receptors can vary depending on their specific location in the body. However, just like dopamine, an imbalance in acetylcholine levels can lead to adverse effects. One such example is myasthenia gravis, an autoimmune disease characterized by a decreased number of acetylcholine receptors, leading to symptoms like muscle weakness and fatigue. In the context of mental health, Alzheimer's disease is marked by progressive memory loss and cognitive decline, and this has been linked to deficiencies in acetylcholine. To manage Alzheimer's, a common therapeutic approach involves the use of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. These drugs are designed to inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine in the brain, thereby increasing its level and improving cognitive function. In contrast, an overabundance of acetylcholine can give rise to a condition known as cholinergic syndrome. This is characterized by symptoms like muscle weakness, blurred vision, and difficulty breathing. 
Acetylcholine also plays a vital role in learning and memory. It functions in brain areas, such as the hippocampus and cortex. Acetylcholine is thought to facilitate neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to adapt and change as a result of experience, thus forming the foundation of our learning and memory-forming capabilities. Acetylcholine is pretty important. You can see that acetylcholine clearly stimulates our brain, and for that reason, I'm going to have to put it into A tier, which is appropriate, because it starts with an A. In this video, we delved into the fascinating world of neurotransmitters, exploring their diverse functions and the intricate biochemistry behind them. We examined some key neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, acetylcholine, glutamate, and GABA, unraveling their roles within neurons and shedding light onto the mechanisms by which they operate. We hope this exploration has provided you with a deeper understanding of the fundamental role neurotransmitters play in shaping our thoughts, emotions, and actions. If you enjoyed this video, it wouldn't hurt to share it with someone else who might enjoy it. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Bananas. I feel it in my body, I feel it in my soul. My neurons start to fire and chaos explodes. Heart is pumping, mind is running, driving me.